Hey. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Are you ready for the last stretch of the day? So, last time I'm on stage, hopefully. <laughs> so, I'm here to present Kate Pinkott. She's a um, product manager at Clio, an AI app that helps people get out of financial trouble. She's a trained uh, co design coach aiming to level up the product design and leadership and a wonderful speaker because I saw her talk from last year and I, it was really amazing. So she's a second time speaker at this event um, and uh, she, she talked about uh, trading physical objects in the blockchain. So uh, it was a great talk after this one. You should check the other one too. Uh, really looking forward to it. Um, give a warm, warm welcome to Kate. I'm going to use that. All right. Thank you all for your attention and your presence and your energy. We've got two more talks, so I will invite you to have a little stretch and. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. Just get ready for the next part. This talk is called Name It and Reframe It. And if somebody wants to come up with a little jingle for me, I'm kind of looking for like a little hand gesture or if you have any ideas, please talk to me. I want to make it a thing. Yeah, yeah, reframe it. Yeah, like the crop tool. Yeah, I like that. Um, because it's actually a series I'm doing. I'm doing a series of talks on this and this is one of the first. So really excited to get your feedback. The first section, or the first talk of these series, is reframing design value. And it's really cool to see lots of relevant uh, themes picked up in some of the um, talks today around this topic. And so hopefully, um, we can kind of go through. But I want to start by doing a little poll. I want you to raise your hand if you have a design in your head or an idea that you have really, really wanted to do but you haven't shared it with anyone. Raise your hand. Okay. Keep your hands raised if you've also, or in addition, you've ever had an idea that was really, really cool, and you shared it with your colleagues at work, but they were like, meh. They were a little bit like, oh, whatever. Yeah. No, keep hands, keep hands up. We're going to get to exercise. OK. Have any of you, you shared the idea, you got buy-in, and I don't get tired on me, and then you realized there wasn't enough time to ship it. So you had an idea, you, got, you managed to get it, they were really excited and, oh, sorry, we ran out of time. Okay, there's most of you in the room, but keep going, keep going, go. change hands if you want. <laughs> and then, <laughs> lastly, which of you have ever had an idea that you really wanted to do, you shared it, you got buy-in, the team are excited, you even did the designs for it, and then it never shipped. More hands go up, okay. Most of the room, have had this experience. You can put your hands down now. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Most of us have experienced this, haven't we? And what are the kinds of feelings that come up when this happens to us? Well, we don't have influence, so we feel a bit disempowered, don't we? We can't get through the thing that we want to do. And that brings up lots of emotions in our body. What are emotions? They're just sensations in this physical thing that we have, right? What kinds of sensations come up? Have a little think. You might be thinking, well, I'm a bit disappointed. I'm a bit frustrated. I'm feeling a bit rejected. Maybe even shame or embarrassed. Maybe you're just really sad. Maybe you're grieving. We all have, maybe you're resentful and angry. But what if I told you that you didn't have to feel that way? And what if I told you there was a way to make your team actually believe in what it is that you have to say, and to get it past that line, and to get your ideas into the world, and not die in the Figma graveyard, right? Well, there is, because the result would be that you feel like this little man here. You would feel, that's so old, by the way. Um, <laughs> you would feel confidence, you would feel recognition, you would feel respect and pride about your work, wouldn't you? Because you managed to get it out of your head through your body, through your team, through the organization, and into the real world. So that is what I'm going to share with you today. You're going to walk away today with three tools that you can use to reframe the way that you talk about the value of design. Does that sound good? You want to get that influence? 
You want to get them out in the real world? Okay, woo! All right. Let's do it. So, that, that, that was a bit delayed. Design influence, woo! <laughs> cool. So, what is a reframe? What do I mean when I say a reframe? Um, it's not just what you see through your phone, through the world, it, it is that, but it's also something that you choose, right? A reframe is how you choose to think about something. And we can move this frame around and we can choose to have different thoughts. And I actually have a, a free little uh, fig jam thing that you can look up on the community on Figma. If you just type in um, design coaching or something, it will come up. In, and essentially, it takes you through your beliefs and your thoughts lead to those feelings, the sensations that we have in the body. And guess what those sensations lead to? Action or inaction. It's the thoughts that lead to the emotions that lead to the actions or inactions. And your actions are what lead to your results. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm leaning on the work of brilliant psychologists who kind of come up with this model. And um, go check it out. Have a think about it because it's our thoughts that we're going to be talking about today. It's how we reframe our thinking. And you can move this frame bigger, you can move it smaller, and you can move it around. And you can choose what you focus on. So mindset coaching is something that's top of mind. Now, some examples. You might have heard of um, reframing irrational thoughts. That's quite a common one that everyone's heard of. Something like, I can't do it. You could reframe it to, I can't do it yet. This is the worst thing ever. I'm going to die. And you could say, well, yeah, it is difficult. But you know what? I'm going to get through it. If this isn't perfect, then I'm a complete failure, and it's a failure. Extremist thinking, right? Well, perfect is unrealistic. No one's perfect, right? And I'm doing my best, and that's what matters. So you notice how all of these reframes, they help us to be more balanced and to think about things from a different perspective. Another one that you might have heard of, another type of reframe, is Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. Anyone heard of that one before? If you haven't, take a picture now. I'll get out the way. Check it out. Use it. It's brilliant. You can use it in your teams. You can use it all over the place. And this is where you pretend to put on a hat, a different way of thinking, and you think about things from different perspectives. And what you're doing is reframing, yeah? So, we understand what a reframe is, but what does it give you? It gives you more ideas. That's all it does. It helps you to see more options, more potentials. Because sometimes when we're trying to influence people in our team, we get a bit stuck, right? We try something, it doesn't work, and we give up. And what I want for you as designers is to not get stuck, but to keep trying new ways of reframing your thinking. So here are the three tools. We're going to do me to we, but to better, and PD to XFN. Who, who doesn't know what this means? XFM, okay. Cross-functional collaboration. So cross-functional just means anyone that's a design adjacent. So it could be an engineer, it could be a data scientist, it could be a product marketing manager, a PM, um, PD, product designer. Cool, so let's go into the first one. What do I mean by me to we? Well, we've got three lenses that we can think about. We've got self-orientation, which is all about me. Then we've got team orientation, which is about the people that I'm working with. And then we've got the business orientation. And all of these orientations are very useful. But what designers tend to do is they tend to stay in that one in the corner, right? So what is that self-orientation one? They think about my opinion, my tasks, my capacity, my skills, my calendar, my time management, my interests, and my professional development. And these are really important things, okay? We want to be thinking about these things. And we also want to be considering other things. Because it's not all about you. When we're working in a team, it's not just about ourselves, right? And what we tend to do is we get a little bit locked into a tunnel. So I want you to start thinking and considering team orientation. What are the shared goals that I have with my teammates? What are the shared timelines, shared metrics? What is the shared culture that we have? And when you're thinking about business and the companies that you work for, ask yourself, do I know what our business purpose is? Do I know what our mission is? Could I actually tell you what the vision is? Or is it just a slide that gets lost and no one talks about? 
do I know what our strategy is? And like, does anyone else in the company know what the strategy is? Does anyone know what they're doing? And what are our company metrics or OKRs, KPIs? What are our company values? These are really important questions that we must know as designers. Not maybe, not sometimes. To be a successful designer, we must know these things, okay? This is non-negotiable, people. And I'm gonna have a few examples to bring this to life, okay? So, a me statement is, you're talking to your team and you might say something like, I don't think I have time to fit this in the week. Right? That's honest, you might say, that's fair. But is it influential? Is it persuasive? No, it's not. So try something like this, where we say to your PM, let's say, do we estimate that task X or Y better aligns to our sprint goal? Because there isn't capacity for both, right? Do you see the slight shift that we've made there? We're talking about we, what do we collectively estimate? You've given me these two things and you want me to do both. So I'm gonna put it back to you and I'm gonna help you to understand that we don't have capacity to do both. But I'm showing you that I'm proactive, I'm a solution person, I'm positive, and I'm gonna frame this as making sure that we align to our sprint goal. So I'm showing an awareness of my team. I'm being orientated to my team. It's not just about me. And this one just sounds so much better. It sounds like you care about your teammates and you're not just thinking about yourself, right? Let's go another one. Somebody, your boss maybe, comes along and they give you this really crappy piece of work and you're like, oh, I just don't wanna do this. And you say to them, what is the incentive of me doing this? Like there's no, how are we gonna measure my impact? No one cares about design. We heard that earlier in one of the talks, right? Instead, you could say to your boss, okay, cool, I'll do this. I'll do this task, this crappy task that no one else wants to do. But how might we calculate the ROI of this work? How might we measure the success of this work? Now you're starting to think more creatively about what am I gonna get from this, right? What, how am I gonna show that this is actually valuable to the company? I'll give one more and then we'll get you guys to share something. So another one is my team doesn't want to work on low impact stuff. Our company strategy, pointing to something bigger than ourselves, prioritizes X, whatever it is that you guys are focusing on right now which feels more aligned with task B than A. So I think we should be doing that one because it aligns better to the mission and the strategy of what we're doing. That's more persuasive than, yeah, I just don't feel like it, right? Cool. So let's go into the room. I want you to think about a time when you've had something that you really didn't want to do or you didn't agree with. Anyone put up their hand, anything, small thing, project, a task, anything that they were like, you know what, I just don't want to do that. I'm putting on you. Of course. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of like the last few examples that I had like this. Um, yeah, some, some focus on the wrong things in terms of what should be the first thing to develop when we were doing a rebranding, actually. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so priority. Your team has got the wrong priority. They're asking you to do animations and they're asking you to do really final details. And you're thinking, well, we don't even know why we're doing that. We haven't spoke, who, who is our user, right? We haven't even spoken to our user. So how might we reframe that if we're using this um, methodology of thinking about the team? How might you reframe the thought, we don't even know who our users are yet? Any ideas? Anyone want to give it a go? I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> All right. An idea might be, when we think about priority, is that your team has limited capacity, right? I'm gonna put this one down. Um, your team has limited capacity. They can't do hundreds of hours of work, right? There's only five of you, or how many are of you? So you could say something like, given that we're five people and that there's 20 things to do, I think we've probably got time to do two of them. Which are the two most important for the team right now? 
So you're reframing, you're saying, I want to do all of them, but which two are we going to start with first, right? So do you see how that's a bit more positive? We're not saying we can't do all these things, we're not being negative, but you are saying that you understand there's an awareness that there is a time resource limitation. All right, cool. So connecting the design to the business objectives, that's a way to go from I to we. Calculating the ROI of design, making sure you're measuring the impact of what you're doing, not just your own time and money. And getting buy-in from the business decision makers. So really pointing to the things that they care about and aligning with those things. That's going to make you a lot more influential. All right. I'm, I did this terrible video last night, but um, let's pretend that I'm a really good actress, OK? So I'm going to give you example one and example two. Are you ready? Isn't it obvious? Users will find the side-by-side -side comparison visually much easier to make a decision. And my version is just so much more intuitive, right? I think it looks better and it's easier to use. If we go with this, we'll have a much stronger design and overall end-to-end -end user experience. Okay. So I'm talking about a random project. It doesn't even matter what it is, what the details are. But I'm talking, I started off by saying, isn't it obvious, like the answer that we should be going for? And then I said a statement about what users will think and feel. So I, I don't have any evidence. I just made an assumption. And then I was like, but my version is just so much better, right? That's a subjective statement. And then I went on to talking about what I think and what I want versus what the team wants. And lastly, I talk about how it's all about design, as if the engineers, the data scientists, the PMs, they don't matter somehow, right? So I'm going to show you another version. I want you to really notice carefully um, what the difference is. And if we could turn it up a little bit, that'd be great, because I think it's a bit difficult to hear. Experiment time. The team's hypothesis states that if the cards are placed side by side, it is likely to increase the information comparability. And we think that this will lead to 50% more users making informed choice selection after three months. We ran some tests, the results are in, we were right, 80% of users are making informed choice selections compared to only 20% before. So the user informed choice selection is a great KPI, it correlates to better ROI for the customers that we serve, and it's our team's leading KPI which will help us to meet our OKRs this quarter. So overall it's balancing both the ROI that we're saving for the users, saving them money, and it's also saving the business money because we think this will have a 10% reduction in all the calls going to the call center. And we think that this will save about 40,000 pounds. Save that money. <laughs> all right, so I want a show of hands. Who thinks the first one is the better video? Who thinks the second one is a better video? I'm surprised. I thought I was going to trick you there, but that didn't work. So I think the answer is both. Because the first one is shorter, and it's a bit more emotional. So I feel like it's a bit more engaging, right? I'm being a bit salty. I'm like sassy, like, woo, I know, and you should listen to me. And then the second one is a bit more clinical, a bit more dry, but it's really evidence-based. And I think we need both, right? We need our personal opinions. We need intuition, but we also need evidence. So when you're looking to have influence, I want to encourage you to try and merge the two. I am not wanting us to live in a world where we only rattle off facts and figures based on tests. Not everything needs to be tested, right? But I do want us to try and do a better job as designers of advocating for when there is evidence and for advocating for really logical, methodical arguments where we can. A lot of creativity is intuitive, and sometimes we'll need to lean into that. So see what we can do to merge the two and balance them. All right, so to recap, me to we, what is it about? It's about finding common ground with your colleagues. It's about tying your objectives back to the companies. Shh, don't mention the D word, okay? Try not to talk about design. I mean, we talked about this earlier in one of the panels. It's a loaded term. A lot of companies don't like it. It's not gonna help you build influence. Instead, 
talk about the impact that you're going to have and the results that you've derived. Because that way, your ideas will get unblocked and you will have more influence. All right, we've done number one. Now we're on to number two, but to better. This one's a little bit easier, okay? I'm sure all of you are really, really good at this. What does but to better mean? This is when we start off by listening to somebody in the room, maybe one of our teammates, and as soon as they start speaking, you're like, yeah, but. And I'm sure you've all had that experience, right? Yeah, but that's not gonna work. And our internal little monkey mind is on overdrive, looking out. If you think about the Edward de Bono um, exercise, that's the black hat, okay? That's the negative hat. So we all have that, and, and that's natural, and either, even Oprah Winfrey isn't positive all the time, right? So I'm not saying that there isn't space for this. But when we want to take that word and thought out of our mouth, and we want to actually share it with our team, you're going to have a lot more influence if you manage to shift it up one notch. If you manage to look at what, what's positive, and even further, what's inspiring, right? So I'm going to give you some examples. I am not saying that you need to make everything sunshine and rainbows and not talk bluntly when something's going wrong. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having multiple tools in your toolbox that you can use when you need it. If the only tool you have is the negative hat, you don't have a multitude and range of tools, do you? You've got one and you're overusing it. So let's have a go at trying some of the other ones because it will help you to be more effective. So. What does the no negative focus look like? We've all heard it. It's, this is a bad idea. This UX is confusing. Why is everything always changing in this company? We don't have time for that. This is really poor quality. This is just absolutely pointless. Like, why are we even doing this? I'm the only one who cares on this team. This is chaos, right? We've all had these thoughts in teams. So if you're feeling them, you're not alone, okay? Every designer goes through them. Every member of the team goes through them. But how can we reframe that? Because when you say those things, guess what? La, 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 la. They're not hearable. No one wants to hear that. And people just shut down. And even if you repeat yourself, this is what your colleagues are like, okay? They're just not listening. And as designers, if you want a seat at the table, your words need to be hearable. There's no point being right, I'm, but I'm right, okay? You're right and you're alone. You're right and no one's following you. So if we want to be influential, we need to shift this. What are some examples that we might be able to explore? OK. So when we're being more positive, we're trying to focus on, okay, well, what do we have in our hand right now? Not what do we not have. Let's start with what we do have. What we do have. We've covered X. We've made some progress in this thing. Expanding we should have this because that would make it even stronger, right? So you've probably heard the, um, have you heard of the shit sandwich? That's a kind of overused thing that happens quite a lot. Another overused sentence is building on that. Have you heard that one? Building on one, yeah, nods. You don't have to make it formulaic. I'm not saying that you become a robot. I'm just asking you to think in your thoughts. How can I focus on what we do have and how can I focus on making it even better? Right, because that attitude is more hearable. And instead of crushing your poor teammates, <laughs> you're going to be grabbing their hand and lifting them up, right? How do we make it inspiring, though? Because right now, I'm angry, I'm annoyed. How do I shift into that headspace of inspiration? Well, you can ask yourself questions like, imagine if we could. I'm really curious to explore. I'd love to see. You want to shift from this is rubbish, to this could be better, to I'm really excited to see something else. And when you come from that place of curiosity and uh, generating a, a different energy, you'll actually find people want to listen to you a lot more, right? So I'd love to see this. What if we could achieve this? And you know what, in the moment, it's kind of difficult to come up with these. I don't know if you've been ever sitting in a critique or a design review, and all you can think of is this is so bad. Why did this person do this? Uh, they're trying to make me poke my eyes out. But people are never doing that. People have good intentions, right? So have a go at writing this down. You can do it, but you can just practice by journaling. You can just have a write before and, and see how it goes. All right, let's do some examples. 
you're thinking, I don't have time to take a break. Maybe this is you're talking to yourself. Everyone, anyone ever felt like that? I'm so packed, I've got so much work on, I've got no time to take a break. A classic reframe is to say, okay, it's okay to have a small break. I'll feel fresher, I'll do better work, and it will help me stay motivated. Ed, motivated. Another one, you're looking at something and you're thinking, man, my team's making this way too complicated, right? Instead of saying, this is way too complicated, why are we doing this, negative, you could say something like, well, what is the smallest iteration that we could test first? That's an open question, right? That's like offering more opportunity, more options. And lastly, yeah, but this is not accessible. Why are we doing this? You can say, building on this, it would be cool to make this design inclusive for colorblind users, something like that. So I think you get the point. Now it's over to you. All right, get ready with your crappy negative voices. I want it all, give it to me. What's a negative thing that you've heard someone say or you've said? Negative thing, come on, it's so easy to come up with negative things. Designer. Something that really annoys you in design. Really annoys? Um, yeah. the, um, well, not doing the user interviews at first. Yes. That is a big one. <laughs> They're not doing the user interviews. They're not investing in user research. Oh, these guys are so stupid, aren't they? Don't they know that we need user research? <laughs> so dumb. Okay, let's not jump straight to inspiration. Let's just nudge it up a little bit. What's something positive that we could say about this? How could we, how could we reframe this? Something like, okay, well, this is really exciting. We're at the start of the project. What a great opportunity to do some user research and find out more about our customers. Brilliant. So we have an opportunity in front of us. Love that. We don't know much about our users. Wouldn't it be great to find something out? Whoa, okay. Now how are we going to make it even more inspiring? Who can, who can build on that and make it even more inspiring? Um, yeah, maybe touching on the, the first point that we said from um, from me to we, I think it would be good to kind of align it to the overall strategy. So um, thinking about the business impact and like formulating something around that. So I guess that would be the approach. Brilliant. So now this user research is not only going to help us learn about our users and we're going to learn about all the things that we don't know yet and it's an opportunity. On top of that, we're going to make sure that it's not wasted and dumped, but actually it aligns to the strategic goals of the C-suite, right? People that are the decision makers, the purse carriers. Brilliant. I love it. See, you got this. Okay. So, caveat. It's always good to have a caveat. If it feels fake when you say it, it's going to come across fake. So I'm, I'm in no way telling you guys to go around pretending to be positive. It's not like that. It's a practice, right? It's a muscle. You get used to it. You practice, you write, and it becomes more effortless. But the more effortless and the more you practice, the more easy it's going to become to you. And design is never done. And our approach to design is never done, right? This is a work in progress. I'm still working on this. You know, just because I'm saying this doesn't mean that I nail it every time. I am flawed and full of faults. So I want you to just have a go at being mindful about this every day, just every single day. Can I make this a bit more inspiring? Can I focus on something a bit more? All right, so to recap, your second tool of reframing that you're taking away today is stop yourself before you speak negatively. Think, is there another way to reframe this? Or am I just being lazy? Connect your desire to something greater and more inspiring than yourself, something bigger than yourself, something bigger than this task, something bigger than your team. And practice doing this, doing journaling, because that's actually gonna make it easier for you. This will make your contribution more hearable, and as a result, you will be more influential. Boom. All right, your third tool, PD to XFN. I have two minutes. So we've got product design thinking, we've got engineering thinking, product management thinking, and data analytics. There's way more functional partners, right? So there's so many different people we work with, but I just chose these as the most common ones. And 
you'll notice that there's a lot of overlaps in the way we think, a, a lot of common ground, but I'm going to try and focus on um, some divergences in the way that we think so that you can be more empathetic to them. So we're going to get rid of the tunnel vision where we only think about me, myself, and I, and just you know, product design, and we're going to think more about our other disciplines that we have to work with. So I'm going to start with pity thinking. I'm not going to read all these out, but essentially we're trying to look at who is this for? Who is the end user? What problem does this solve? And to some of the other uh, speakers that have spoken right at the bottom here, what is the unintended consequences that our solution could cause, right? We're often asking why a lot. You can take a picture of this, you'll get the presentation later, but these are the types of questions that we ask as designers. Um, there's probably some missing. Anyone want to call out one that's missing? Something that you think, ah, oh, I ask this all the time. All right. Engineering thinking. They have a slightly different bent. They, they should be thinking about some of those, but they're kind of more focused on the feasibility, right? Because they're the builders. They're the ones that have to execute the idea. So they're thinking more about constraints and priority. We think about that too, but they are just more spending time on that. They're thinking about the edge cases just like we do, but they actually have to code it. So they're kind of thinking about it in a different way. They're thinking about what's the most efficient often. They're thinking about, can we reuse anything that we already have? A good designer will be looking at this list and be like, yeah, I think about all those things. That's because you're thinking of your fun cross-functional partner. That's because you're empathetic. So well done for you. They're also thinking about, can this reliably scale, right? Scale across different devices or scale from millions to billions of users, right? Not, a, not an easy, easy job. Um, who's ever heard a engineer say this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't make them ask. Just do it. Do it. We know they want it. And this one, anyone know what a bug bash is? That was like, when's the bug bash? That's like the QA process, right? The quality assurance process. They love a good bug bash because engineers love to find bugs. It's really fun. So, PM thinking. It's slightly different. Any PMs in the room? Or used to be a PM? Or going to be a PM? Oh, nice. Okay, one. Okay, you can point out if anything's missing here. They're more thinking about the viability, right? They're thinking about is this investment worth it for the cost? Like, is the value we're going to get worth it for the cost that it's going to cost us? They're thinking about, do, does my team have a clear idea of the goal and priority? How are we going to measure success? Okay? A lot of the things that the designers will think about, but slightly different bent. And again, for d data. I think we've run out of time. So again, take a picture. You can come back to this late. If you start asking some of these questions to your data partners, they will love you. They'll be like, wow, this designer is reading my mind. This designer understands me. You can also ask them directly. You can just say, look, what are your concerns? That would save a lot of this homework. <laughs> All right. So imagine that we had Google Translator for disciplines. And we could just translate our thinking. Wouldn't that be cool? So we've got, we're trying to remove barriers to make it hard for users. Hard? Yeah. Barriers that make it hard for users to sign up to our service. That's a human goal, isn't it? The PM's like, yeah, we're just trying to optimize conversion rate. That's what they mean. They'll just say it like that. They'll just throw it out. We're just trying to optimize conversion rate. And in your head, you're thinking of like a, just like a, a whole bundle of other thoughts and other thinking in terms of the user barrier. So it's, we're saying the same thing. It's just different words. PD. The visual, the visual consistency increases user trust and reduces the cognitive load on the form field UI. The end is like, yeah, let's merge these three form field variants into a single component, because that's just not efficient, right? So we're kind of saying the same thing, but we also have our own jargon. So we need to learn each other's languages so that we can speak each other's points. And lastly, same one, user behaviors don't happen within a week. Their financial cycles, if it was financial, happen over months. We're not going to be able to measure this change that we're making in, in a week. We need longer. Then the data would say, OK, well, we need a larger testing window of 90 days to get statistical significance. You'd be like, statistical what? I'm sorry? Same thing. It means the same thing. It's just a different way of talking about it. So we don't have time for a live example. You'll be glad to hear. But I am. <laughs> I know, you were like really looking forward to it. But if we were to do this, how cool would this be? 
we were to translate, I'm going to give you one example of each discipline. So how can we make users know about our new feature and that it's easy to understand? That's a pretty common design problem, right? Well, the PM is going to say, how can we increase the click-through rate on this button, if it's a website or if it's a, a form? The data analyst is going to say, well, what tracking do we have on this CTA already? What is our benchmark? And what are our success factors? And the engineer is saying, uh, can we increase that? I just clearly gave up at that point. <laughs> so in summary, you've probably seen this from a sustainability bent of ego to eco, where instead of placing humans at the top, we're just one of the gang, right? Designers probably don't mean to, but they often think like that. They often create this pyramid and they think that they are running the show, when actually we're just one of a gang and we need to learn about the other animals in the ecosystem, different species, and we need to be able to speak their language and understand them, right? So to recap, learn what other functions do, why they are important, connect their approach to the common goal that you share, and learn to speak their language. So those are the three techniques. I hope you go away and enjoy them and love them and use them. It's going to give you more options. It's going to help you generate different ways of thinking about the world. And it's going to give you more influence. So thank you very much.